The title of my talk uh, is or are the four Ds of eosinophilic esophagitis, namely drugs, diet, dilation, and most recently we've added one more drug. I have no financial disclosures and I will be talking about non-FDA approved therapies. So here is the standard definition of eosinophilic esophagitis. It represents a chronic immune antigen mediated esophageal disease characterized clinically by symptoms related to esophageal dysfunction. In adults, they present with dysphagia, food impactions in the pediatric population, you know, failure to thrive, vomiting, abdominal pain, and histologically by eosinophilic predominant inflammation. And at the bottom, you can see what a histopathologist would see when diagnosing a patient with EOE, a predominance of eosinophils, together with other features like basal zone, uh, hyperplasia, and laminopropria fibrosis. And on the right is what we would see as gastroenterologist endoscopically. So here is the pathogenesis of EOE, and we believe we were, the patients are exposed to some sort of food, foodborne allergen. However, it might be exposure to a microbe or some sort of you know, genetic mutation. But what is common to all phases is that there's a predominance of a marked inflammatory response, a large amount of eosinophils and mast cells, and there's really an activation of the Th2 response, and Th2 it coordinates interleukins 4, interleukins 13, and interleukin 5. This results in accumulation of more inflammatory modulators, including eotaxin 3, and we know that eotaxin 3 results in accumulation of eosinophils in the esophagus. All these result in remodeling of the esophageal wall, loss of epithelial barrier, as well as uh, eosinophilic inflammation. So esophageal eosinophilia is not always EOE, and in terms of the diagnostic algorithm, if you have a patient that presents clinically uh, with symptoms suggestive of EOE, they should undergo an upper endoscopy with multiple level esophageal biopsies. If you then have esophageal eosinophilia as characterized by more than 15 eosinophils per high-powered field, you then should evaluate for non-EOE uh, disorders that potentially could contribute to esophageal eosinophilia. And I've uh, highlighted them on the right, and starting at the top, we have the so-called EGIDs, which are the non-esophageal uh, eosinophilic conditions. We know that our patients with acid reflux might have a predominance of eosinophils in the, dif in the distal esophagus. Uh, achalasia, Crohn's disease, connective tissue disorders, various infections, hypersensitivity, drug reactions can all, pre all present with esophageal eosinophilia. So if you have at least made a good attempt to exclude all those other causes and your patient meets the above two criteria, then you have a diagnosis of uh, EOE. This is a very useful scoring system and I encourage all gastroenterologists to use the scoring system uh, in their reporting, both for uh, evaluating a patient with suspected EOE as well as monitoring their progress over time. It's very useful in a research setting and you can uh, you know, track your patients in terms of improvement over serial endoscopies. And this is the E of score. The first E is, uh, identifies edema. Edema is basically the, last, the, the loss of vascular marking, so you decide whether um, vascularity is present or absent and you'd give them a score for edema. In terms of rings, this is the tracheolization and this is the only uh, parameter that has four grades. Uh, exudates are these white plaques that are seen on the esophagus and could be present in less than 10% esophageal surface area or more than 10% esophageal surface area. The F represents furrows, which are vertical lines. And lastly, strictures might be absent or present. But we know from data that we're generally poor at determining whether a patient has a stricter, especially in EOE, and often these strictures are very subtle. So just make that extra time just to make sure your patient doesn't have a subtle stricture. The ear of score only looks at endoscopic features. This was a most recent uh, scoring system, the IC score, which takes into account um, symptoms and complications, uh, endoscopic features, as well as histologic features. And the patient is basically given a score for all three of these parameters. So in terms of symptoms, it's the frequency of dysphagia. In terms of complications, it's whether there's been food impactions, hospitalizations, uh, failure to thrive, even esophageal perforation. So that takes care of symptoms and complications. The next part of the score is the inflammatory response in the esophagus, both uh, assessed endoscopically either with edema, furrows, or exudates, as well as the actual number of eosinophils seen histologically. And the final component of the score is the so-called fibrostenotic component, where you'd want to know in terms of rings and strictures, and 
Specifically, you'd ask your histologist to comment on uh, lamina propria fibrosis or basal cell hyperplasia. And this is a way we can actually tell our patients if they have inactive disease, mild EOE, moderate EOE, or severe EOE. Just be careful when uh, taking history from your patient and determining whether you know, their symptoms correlate with disease severity because EOE patients have learned multiple adaptive behaviors over the years. There's often a very long diagnostic delay between uh, actually making the diagnosis of EOE. And these patients might imbibe fluids with meals. Uh, they modify how they eat in terms of cutting into small pieces and sometimes even pureeing. Um, your EOE patient might say that they eat much longer than everyone else in the family. Um, they would avoid harder textured foods, chew excessively, and sometimes even turn away tablets or pills. So just be careful in terms of history and severity because there's not often a good correlation. So onto the talk, we are lucky now in 2023 to have uh, multiple uh, tools and methods of treating our patients with EOE, including the four Ds, drugs, diet, dilation, and most recently, dupilumab. So PPIs for EOE have been around for a long time, and back in 2007, if you had a patient suggestive symptoms, what you'd do is you'd start them on high-dose PPI for about two months, and if they got better, they were diagnosed with something called PPI-responsive esophageal eosinophilia, the so-called PPI-RE. Uh, if they did not get better on the high-dose PPI trial, then they were diagnosed as having EOE. And this is really unusual in medicine to use a, a, a medicine to make a diagnosis. So if somebody gets better, they have a disease, and if it doesn't get better, they don't have a disease. And thankfully, in 2018, it took these amounts of um, researchers to agree at the AGREE conference, and they determined that the term PPRE should no longer exist. Uh, the diagnostic of trial of PPI therapy is no longer needed, and PPI should be used uh, equally as a potential first-line therapy, just like any other uh, treatment would for EOE. So how do PPIs work outside of the acid-blocking properties? We know that PPIs have anti-inflammatory properties. They're also antioxidant. So they decrease oxidative bursts, they decrease phagocytosis, they decrease adhesions, uh, adhesion molecules. Uh, we know that they block the proton pump, which is a hydrogen uh, potassium ATPH channel. Uh, this results in lower levels of eotaxin-3, and as I said previously, eotaxin-3 is what causes migration of eosinophils in the esophagus. Uh, PPIs also decrease uh, IL-13, which is the major uh, cytokine in the Th2 response. And lastly, and maybe most importantly, PPIs improve the impaired epithelial barrier of the esophagus. They decrease the number of uh, dilated intracellular spaces, and they actually help to decrease antigen passage into the esophagus. So some tips for using PPI therapy when treating EOE. We recommend uh, a dose of omeprazole, 20 milligrams BID or equivalent. Uh, in, the in the most recent studies, the pooled histologic response is about 40%. Um, in terms of adverse effects, I, I previously spoke last year on the uh, effects or the potential side effects of PPI therapy. And I think at this point, if a patient needs to be on PPI therapy, I think we can safely use it and even on a chronic long-term basis. Uh, as gastroenterologists, we're very adept at prescribing PPI therapy. They often have low cost, readily available, the ease of administration, and are generally well tolerated. So with a 40% response rate, I think PPI therapy is a good first choice for uh, patients with EOE. What about topical steroids? And this is the, the second D within drugs, topical steroids for treating EOE. And these are basically the asthma medications which we have borrowed uh, to help us treat EOE. And the two preparations available to us is the budesonide, uh, which is a viscous solution, and the recommended maintenance dose is about two milligrams per day. Uh, another preparation that we can use is a fluticasone uh, meter dose inhaler, and the recommended maintenance dose is 880 to 1,760 micrograms per day. I think at the outset, it takes time to actually explain to your patients why you're using a so-called asthma medicine to treat what I sometimes will call is, you know, EOE asthma of the esophagus. And basically with the meter dose inhaler, the patient puts the inhaler in their mouth, accumulate a little bit of saliva, squirt the vapor into the mouth, and instead of breathing it into their lungs like an asthma patient would, they have to try to swallow it. And, you know, this is easier said than done. And back in 2012, Evan uh, Dellen and colleagues actually did the study where they had 25 patients, and you can see in panel A, they all underwent scintigraphy, and 
In panel A, the patients received budesonide one milligram BID viscous. And you can see that most of the uh, budesonide actually went down the esophagus and landed up in the stomach. Contrast that with panel B, which were the patients that received budesonide either inhaled or nebulized, and you can see that the vast majority actually landed up in their lungs and hardly any landed up in um, the stomach. So the rationale for all this is that with increased mucosal contact in the esophagus, you get uh, decreased eosinophil counts, and you know that's why potentially a patient might prefer the oral viscous budesonide over the nebulized inhaled form. Um, so the other group of medications I mentioned was the oral viscous budesonide, and this is once again an asthma respiel that a patient with asthma might use for nebulization treatment. And what they need to do is they convert this into some sort of slurry, so they need to add some sort of mixing medium. Uh, most of the data is on Splenda, which is a sucral, a sucral uh, close-based slurry. Uh, the patient almost wants to make a, a lotion that they can swallow and use this to coat the esophagus, and they need to do this twice a day. Uh, other mediums that have been recommended are applesauce, honey, and even stevia. Uh, the other formulation which we're waiting for bated breath here in the United States is an oral dispersible budesonide tablet, or even a, a pre-compounded uh, oral budesonide slurry. Um, it is available in Canada and Europe, but not yet available in the United States. So this is how the oral budesonide tablet works. Patient puts it in their mouth. The budesonide uh, mixes with saliva, and within one to two minutes, uh, it coats the esophagus and gets to work in the esophageal mucosa. So if you are going to decide a, a topical steroid for your patient, you know, which one should you use and which has the better e effectivity? Um, once again, uh, Evan Dellen and colleagues did the study where they compared uh, budesonide versus uh, fluticasone, and you can see that uh, there was improvement in all patients who used either budesonide or fluticasone when compared to placebo. And this was for uh, improvement in peak eosinophil count, improvement in dysphagia scores, improvement in eosinophil counts, and improvements in ear of scores. But if you look at the uh, point here, the black bars between uh, budesonide and fluticasone, for all parameters, they were on the same level. So this proves that both uh, topical budesonide and fluticasone uh, is equally effective, and it just really depends you know, which one your patient prefers. Uh, if you are going to use uh, topical steroids for your EOA patient, you have to discuss some sort of maintenance therapy. And in the study, they saw that if they stop the budesonide therapy, uh, after about 87 days, about three months, most patients uh, clinically relapsed versus those patients who remained on some form of continued oral budesonide, they remained in clinical remission for up to a year. And the AGA, JTF, uh, society guidelines most recently recommended continuation of topical glucosteroids over a discontinuation of treatment. So some uh, tips and pearls for using steroids for EOE is just recommend to your patient not to eat or drink anything for between 30 and 60 minutes afterwards. I'll often tell my patients to take uh, their medication after breakfast or just before bedtime. There is obviously the concern for oropharyngeal or esophageal candidiasis, but this is uh, easily treated with uh, antifungal medications. The concern for adrenal suppression and osteoporosis is not really um, acknowledged in the data, and we don't really have to monitor uh, serum cortisol or bone density scans. So just to summarize, about 65% of patients who go on some form of topical uh, corticosteroid will go into histologic remission. Um, just remember that you are using these asthma medications off-label, so often you'll have to you know, explain carefully to your patient as, as well as the pharmacist that you are using this for uh, EOE and not for asthma. And then just bear in mind that sometimes the cost of these preparations might be prohibitive. Uh, what about diet uh, for treating EOE? So there's three options we have. The first is the elemental diet, and I've really said good luck with trying this on any adult patient. Uh, most of the data is from the pediatric population. The elemental diet is amino acid based. It's a formula, it's hypoallergenic. Uh, they have to mix it with water, uh, pretty much be on a full liquid diet for six weeks. Uh, tolerability is terrible, and apparently these elemental diets taste awful. Uh, in some of the pediatric studies, a lot of the children actually needed uh, feeding tubes just to be able to uh, you know, get through the, 
the taste of the medicine. Uh, at the bottom, directed elimination diets have fallen out of favor because we know that EOE has nothing really to do with an IgE response. So the most common uh, diet that we would recommend is one form of empirical elimination diet, the more restrictive six food versus the four food versus the two food. And you can see below that in the adult population, a uh, six food elimination diet res uh, results in histologic remission in about 70% of patients. And this is pretty much higher than what we saw with PPIs, which was about 40%. So here are the various elimination diets and I probably shouldn't have done smiley faces. I probably should have done unhappy faces because a six food elimination diet involves the exclusion of cow's milk, wheat, egg, soy, peanuts, tree nuts, uh, fish and seafood we have begun to, begun to thought that perhaps we shouldn't be so restrictive and maybe some of these more liberal diets are better. So there's evidence on the four food, the two food, and even the one food. And once again, the AGA JTF has recommended an empiric six food elimination diet over no treatment. When choosing diet uh, as a treatment modality for EOE, uh, be prepared to warn your patient that they will require multiple upper endoscopies uh, with this treatment in that they will need to start the elimination diet of either the six food, the four food, or the two food. And then they undergo their first endoscopy and hopefully they've gone into remission. If they've gone into remission, you then wanna begin the introduction phase and this is when the multiple endoscopies could occur in that you wanna identify various uh, safe foods which you can continue versus those trigger foods which you sh should avoid. So the patient could land up having multiple endoscopies. And then finally, once you do have your patient in histologic remission and they're in the so-called maintenance phase of their disease, you could consider an upper endoscopy as needed. The most recent meta-analysis and systematic reviews have said that maybe the response in terms of diet is not as robust as we originally thought. Originally, we said about 70%, but as you can see, efficacy with some of these less restrictive diets is in the order of about 45, 50%. And as you can see, I've indicated uh, on the left with the green arrow is what we gain with e efficacy, we lose with adherence. And maybe you can recommend to your patient that maybe try the one food elimination diet over the four food elimination diet because you can see that the response rate is similar, about 50%. So maybe we don't need to punish our patients with these more severe restrictive diets and you almost get as much bang for your buck with a one food as you do with a, a four food. So in terms of dietary therapy for EOE, some tips, uh, r remind and just counsel your patient that multiple endoscopies might be needed. We are working on potential alternatives for endoscopy, such as transnasal endoscopy, which can be done in an office setting or various uh, sites of sponges that could be placed you know, at bedside uh, without the need for an endoscopy. Uh, there has to be buy-in with the patient in terms of compliance and adherence. Uh, a college student, no ways is gonna do a six food elimination diet. People that travel and frequent restaurants, that might be uh, more complicated. Be careful if you're avoiding a large food groups uh, there might be significant nutritional deficiencies. And then up front, you have to decide, are you going to do a kind of a step up, more liberal diet versus a more restrictive? And at this point, I'd like to give a shout out to our UCLA uh, dietitian, nutritionist, and Nancy Jaffe and her team would help you navigate some of these issues if you decide with your patient to choose diet for EOE treatment. Moving on to dilation, we know that dilation treats the fibrous donotic component of EOE and we see a very fast uh, clinical improvement, especially in, in the dysphagia, up to in the order of 95% for those patients on some sort of dilation program. Uh, perforation risk is very low as well as hospitalization. Uh, warn your patient up front that they might expect some chest pain. I think if you do this, they'd be more inclined to come back for uh, repeat dilations. And then in terms of which one should you dilate with a balloon or a bougie, the studies have shown that both are equally effective and it's just dependent on the preference of the endoscopist. So when to stop at that endoscopy session, if you see mucosal disruption with the balloon, that's maybe a good time to stop for that, that time. Uh, if you feel resistance with the bougie, uh, you know, be prepared to bring the patient back for a next session. And as I said, oftentimes more than one session may be needed. Uh, aim for about 15 to 18 uh, millimeters of esophageal dilation. Um, remember, start low and go slow. Often we talk about the rule of threes, three millimeters per session. And in addition to treating the fibrous donotic component, don't forget that you need to treat the inflammation with one of the mortalities that I've mentioned previously. 
So this brings us on to the fourth D, which is dupilumab, which is the first and only FDA-approved uh, therapy for EOE. And this article in the New England Journal was published in December of 2022. So we know how, or we, we think we know how the pathogenesis of EOE, and this is how dupilumab work, in that it's a monoclonal antibody that blocks interleukin-4 and interleukin-13, which are the main cytokines involved in the Th2 response. The study design was well, well done. It was a double-blind, placebo-controlled, random, uh, randomized controlled trial to assess induction of remission of patients at 24 weeks. The patients were all greater than 12 years of, of age and more than 40 kilograms. They had a confirmed diagnosis of EOE based on more than 15 eosinophils per high-powered field. And all of these patients had been exposed to at least eight weeks of high-dose PPI therapy. They also had a greater than 10 score on the dysphagia symptom questionnaire with a range of between 0 and 84. This was the, the study design and it was in three parts. Part A was randomization on a one-to-one -one of dupilumab 300 milligrams subcutaneously every week versus placebo subcutaneously every week. Part two, the patients got dupilumab 300 milligrams weekly or dupilumab 300 milligrams every two weeks or the placebo uh, was subcutaneously every week. Uh, part C was an extension, and this ran from 24 to 52 weeks. Uh, the two co-primary endpoints were histologic remission, and they were quite strict in that they defined this as uh, eosinophil count of less than six per, uh, greater, uh, less than or equal to six per high power field, together with a change from baseline in the dysphagia symptom questionnaire. And if you look at the uh, analysis of the patients in part A, you can see it's really representative of our EOE patients in terms of most of them being young, most of them being male, and most of them being Caucasian. Um, the patients had been exposed to previous corticosteroids in about 74% of patients, and as I said, all had been on some form of PPI therapy. Uh, the patients had an element of the fibrostatic phenotype that 43% uh, underwent some sort of dilation, and 84% had the associated allergic phenotype. These patients had quite severe EOE in that the average DSQ score was 33, the average eosinophil count was 89 per high-powered high field, and the average EREF score was 6. So here were the outcomes. In terms of histologic remission at 24 weeks, you can see that in both group A and group B, uh, patients who received dupilumab weekly or every two weeks uh, went into remission 60% of time compared to less than 10% with placebo. Uh, the reason dupilumab got approved only at the weekly dose rather than the every two weekly dose was because uh, the DSQ did not improve statistically significantly and the second endpoint was not met, so uh, uh, dupilumab was only approved at the weekly dose, 300 milligrams subcutaneous. Uh, it was a very safe medicine. There were no deaths, very low adverse event rate. Uh, most of the adverse events were infusion site reactions, a few upper respiratory tract infections, and some arthralgia. It's important to point out that we don't need to do any baseline uh, CBC or uh, liver function test monitoring prior to starting dupilumab. And also we don't need to check hepatitis B serology or, or, or tuberculosis status. So currently now in 2023, this is our diagnostic treatment algorithm for EOE. As a patient with suspect of EOE, we should make the best attempt to rule out secondary causes of esophageal eosinophilia. Once we've confirmed the diagnosis of EOE, we have various medical treatment options, including PPI, topical corticosteroids, and now most recently dupilumab. If the patient prefer, uh, prefers dietary therapy, there's various options. But as I said, what you gain with efficacy, you might lose with adherence. Uh, don't forget the fibrostenotic phenotype, and those patients should undergo some sort of dilatory plan, a dilation plan. And then once you've got your patient into remission, you need to discuss some sort of maintenance therapy. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, with multiple therapeutic options available, to us for treating our patients with EOE, it's important that there needs to be shared decision making amongst ourselves and our patients. We know that EOE is a chronic condition and we can remind our patients that the treatment that they start up front is not necessarily the treatment that they're going to be on for the rest of their lives. Uh, we spoke about the shortcomings of symptoms and how patients often under-report versus histologic remission. Uh, in terms of dietary therapy, just prepare your patient for multiple endoscopies, and a dietitian consult up front will be helpful to navigate these issues. In terms of steroids, decide about the route of admission up front, and 
you have to think about some sort of maintenance therapy. Uh, we now have dupilumab, but where we position it in terms of uh, treatment naive EOA patients is still to be decided. And uh, treat the inflammation, but don't forget about fibrostenosis and the potential need for esophageal dilation. Um, thank you very much. Thanks.